the first question is, to be loved, what does this mean when God is the lover? Why is it that God cannot love much or love little? If he does not love equally, then how does he love? Father Love, Father Love Jilla admits that the language of the Bible sometimes indicates that God shows preferential, preferential love, but God cannot love much or love little. How does he explain this language of the Bible? Father Love Jilla uses the example of atmospheric pressure to explain love. Explain the analogy. How does he then explain the difference between a sinner and a saint? The question for Church B from the same book is, what was the problem facing the early church, which was answered with a vision given to St. Peter? Admittedly, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. What is the danger in a strong reaction against a legalistic concept of Christianity? What analogy is used to explain this danger? How do we recognize the presence of God in the sin the sinner commits? What should we be careful not to think God's view towards sin is? And finally, what is our job regarding sin and the sinner explained by the words kill and eat? The first question, to be loved, what does it mean when God is the lover? Whatever our concept of love, all, God, all love means the, um, the moving of one being towards another with the desire for union. Now, the orientation, the, um, the form, the variant is innumerable, but um, is innumerable. It may range from the subhuman to the superhuman, but in all of them, there's always the inclination um, or the tendency towards, uh, towards uh, union. Um, now there, there's, and there's always a desire, whether it is possessive or sacrificial. And the way that God loves us is God loves us by moving closer to us. Um, and this is not just so that we may know him or that we may imitate him, but that he may give himself to us and that we may be joined with him in a union. It would be a negation of God's limitlessness. And that within his person, within God, there is no such thing as that which is quantitative. God's love, if it is indeed the divine essence, is absolute. God simply loves. And he loves us totally. And he loves all men equally. God's love is divine, and that in every act of his love, he shows himself, he shows his indivisibility, and he shows his limitlessness. Admittedly, the language of the Bible tends towards preferential love, or pre excuse me, preferential language. But we must consider two things. First, that God, first that when God um, shows himself to us, first that when God shows himself to us, he uses methods that are adapted to our um, intelligence, which at certain times are at uh, a primitive stage. And it is at that stage that God speaks to us as a teacher and he gives us certain rules. Like, and he gives us certain rules. The second thing that we must remember is that, that the, Bible is, the, the Bible is full of anthropomorphisms, um, which are figures of speech which are excessively human. And that our language and that our vocabulary is often not good enough to describe in its entirety or its in, full, in its fullness the divine essence or the divine love. Divine love is likened to atmospheric pressure in that, um, in that it surrounds all of us and that um, it sustains each being and that it sustains each being and that the pressure is on all sides and that love lays siege to us and, and love looks for an opening or an entrance or a passageway into us, into our heart, so that through it he may permeate everywhere. Is, um, what was the problem facing the early church which was answered with a vision given to St. Peter? The problem facing the early church was that if the church should be the church of only certain people, of the privileged Jews, or if it should open its doors to everybody and be the, per, uh, be the church um, of both Jews and Gentiles. And it was answered by the vision of St. Peter, um, because St. Peter had a vision um, that, w that there was um, a cloth and a vessel coming down from God, and in it, it had all uh, the creatures of the earth, um, all four-legged creatures. And the Lord said to Peter, kill, um, the Lord said to Peter, uh, kill and eat. And Peter said, oh no, Lord, for I do not eat anything which is uncommon or clean. And God said to him, whatever God has cleansed, let thou not call uncommon. 
Um, at the same time, there was a Roman centurion named Cornelius um, who also had a vision to go to Joppa and to, to meet with Peter. Um, so he sent his messengers and then um, they met with, uh, they, they asked Peter if they could go back to him and Peter went back to Joppa and he talked to Cornelius. And meeting with Cornelius, he realized that um, God is no respecter of persons, but that um, he accepts all, that God accepts all who work righteousness, whether they be Jew or Gentile. B. Admittedly, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. What is the danger in a strong reaction against the legalistic concept of Christianity? The danger is that we fall into ethics of situation. Um, ethics, uh, ethics refuse universal principles, refuse to accept universal principles, and confine to a particular situation. What analogy is used to explain this danger? Um, ethics of situations are like boats without um, compasses or their sails, at the mercy of um, the winds and the waves. We have to uh, recognize the presence um, of God in, in every sin that the sinner com commits. God is the one that gives us our being, or rather lends it to us at the time that we are committing this sin. At any moment, God could withdraw his being from us and he could destroy us. But rather, he holds us into existence even when that existence turns against him. Um, how should we be careful not to think God's views towards sinners? Okay. Sin can also contain positive elements. Um, for example, uh, Lev Gillett uses the, the example of the man that enters into sexual relations with a prostitute. Although, um, although their act is wrong, if there's any, um, if, if they feel anything besides egotistical desire, even if it's for a minute or a quarter, uh, or a quarter of a second, some tenderness, some disinter, uh, this something, um, then, um, then God, uh, although we can say that the act is wrong, we, can, we cannot say that the act is right, we can say that limitless love has infiltrated into it and has left a potent seed which can later produce fruits of salvation. So we must, we must not think that God is, um, just because he accepts the sinners, that God loves the sin, but rather that God rejects the sin, yet loves the sinners the same. Question. Scientists have tried to come up with creative theories to try to explain how biopolymers, such as proteins, become assembled with only the right building blocks, amino acids, and only the correct isomers joined with only the correct peptide bonds and only the correct sequence. What are the six theories Walter Bradley discusses? Please describe all six theories in detail and explain why they are false. Church B, question. When discussing God's compassion and mercy, Strobel points out to Norman Geisler numerous examples of when God orders his people to kill. In addition to the destruction of the Amalekites, please name the four examples he gives. Please include the Amalekites in your answer. Please explain Geisler's response to Strobel's argument using the example of the Amalekites. Geisler later states, whoever has repented, God has been willing to save. What is he referring to? They're talking about uh, instances when God in the Old Testament destroys nations completely. Uh, when he destroys nations completely, he, he kills all the innocent children, all the women, all the men. And uh, four examples of this, uh, including the Amalekites, um, uh, include the Canaanites, they include uh, when uh, God killed all the children in Egypt, um, when Moses was saved in that instance, and in Sodom and Gomorrah, when he destroys two towns completely with no, uh, with no regard to who actually, who's actually in them. So uh, Guy responds to this and says, first, let's address the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a warring people. They were uh, really despicable. They lived in a very vain, a very vain corrupt society. Uh, a corrupt society says that has no hope. Uh, even today, even today's society has hope, and they didn't have hope. In fact, they used to uh, trail the Israelites as they were moving, and they would pick off the elderly and kill them. Um, so they were very, uh, you know, and they were, they were attacking uh, God's people. And um, obviously God had to protect his people because this is the people from which the Messiah will come from. So, for, so first of all, God had to protect his people some, some way. So... Um, but even more, some people say also, so one, we have to protect Israelites because of the Messiah coming. But also, um, he says, but what about the children? The children did nothing wrong. Why are we killing them as well? And he says, well, okay, these children live in a society that's so corrupt and so vain that it was actually an act of mercy to kill these children because when they grow up in this society, they would fall into the same ways as these people. And in fact, it says in Isaiah that, uh, that um, 
if a child dies for the age of accountability, that they go to heaven. It says also King, da uh, King David, when his, when his son died, that he went to go see his son. And it even says, and Christ said himself, he said, do not hinder the children from coming to me, for, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those such as these. So the, we know children for the age of accountability will go to heaven. So it was actually an act of mercy that he, they killed these children before they grew up in the society and they'd be condemned to hell. So in this time, before you went to war, you signed a treaty. And in this treaty, uh, you know, you agreed to go to war. And so the understanding was that you had time for your children and wives to leave the, 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 the gathering. But they stayed anyway. So even from a, a point of view from the Israelites, uh, they were playing by the rules, if you will. Um, now, Geyser then states, uh, whoever has repented, God has been willing to save. So um, he says, yes, God did kill, seem to kill indiscriminately. But there's also instances when God saved. Two great examples is, is in Rahab. In Joshua, uh, when, they're, when, they cross, when they're about to cross the, into the promised land, and they're um, about, they, they send two spies in the land of Canaan, and Rahab hides these spies. And, but Rahab uh, is, is a, is a, is a God-fearing person, so, she, so the two spies say, we promise, you know, when we attack the city, we will not kill you, we will save you. And Rahab is saved because um, she was a woman of God. Also, so, um, with, with, uh, with Nineveh, Nineveh was given plenty of, uh, plenty of time to repent, and they did repent. And they came back to God, and God spared them. Not only that, the, um, the people, that the, the Amalekites, people ver seemed to forget that they were given 400 years to repent, and they still didn't repent. So God was very fair in the time he gave them. Uh, he had to protect the, the Messiah that would come from Israel. He, the treaties made it very easy for the kids and children to leave. God was very fair in this. Um, but he's also a, a God of justice. He's a God of 100% justice. The first theory, mere chance. This theory is pretty much, um, it was developed early on when people started talking about the origin of life, but now it's no longer accepted by scientists for various reasons. First of all, back then people thought that there was, um, Fred Hoyle, Sir Fred Hoyle formed the, um, the steady, state, steady state theory of the universe, universe, which states that the universe is infinitely old and non-changing. Um, in 1965, background radiation was found, which means that the Earth, which provided evidence for the Big Bang Theory, which means that the universe is actually finite and not infinite in time, not in space. Um, they estimated the universe to be approximately 14 billion years old and the, per and the Earth to be approximately five billion, five, less than 5 billion years old. And the Earth took a long time to cool down, and the time, between the, um, the time gap between when the Earth cooled down to support life and the, and the first emergence of life is around 400 million years. Obviously, this is not enough time to claim that by mere chance, chemical evolution was, enough to, was, was given enough time to form life. If given an infinite amount of time, no matter how infinitesimal the chances are, it's likely that you will develop life. But if given 400 million years, then that's not enough time. Also, the mathematical um, probability that this would occur is for all practical purposes zero. A scientist stated that the chances that chemical evolution would occur in 400 million years is like saying that um, a tornado would go through a junkyard and form a fully functional Boeing 747 by mere chance. Um, another scientist stated that even if we put together all the carbon in the entire universe and place them on the face of the earth and optimized reaction conditions and allow them to react at the most rapid rate possible, the chance of, and left them for a billion years, the chance of forming one single functional protein is one out of 10 followed by 60 zeros. At some point, scientists came up with a theory that stated that maybe there's something about the, the, the chemicals themselves that means, that suggests that they would want, they would preferably interact with each other such that they would form life molecules. So they, they took, they analyzed 10 proteins and they found that there is some sort of chemical affinity which suggests that um, these, these molecules would preferably react with each other. However, um, Bradley himself actually later on wrote a computer program and analyzed all 250 proteins that were um, in the encyclopedia and he found that the chances that this is um, correct and that these, molecule, these chemicals did have an affinity for one another is zero. It's, it's completely insignificant so that theory was nullified. The third theory for um, hydrothermal vents. Actually, I'll do seating from space. Okay. 
the, th the, third, theor the third theory, seeding from space, um, su was given support when, um, well, first of all, it suggests that organics came from outer space on meteorites or comets or whatever, things that came from space. The biggest problem with this, obviously, is that it moves the problem from Earth's surface to the surface of another planet. Even, I'm not going to go into the Stanley Miller apparatus and what was wrong with that, but we know that, as of the, from the 1980s, that primitive Earth's atmosphere was not methane, ammonia, and, and um, nitrogen. It was actually nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water, which are completely unreactive. So even if you move the problem to another Earth's atmosphere that did have methane and ammonia, you would still have the problem of information. How is the information going to gather such that it's going to form life, form cells? Hydrothermal vents. So this theory suggests that, um, that surf, so sulfur compounds are, um, they gave, they gave life-formed and hydrothermal vents because there are sulfur compounds that give um, molecules a strange sort of energy form. But the problem with this is that all the water in the, in the ocean tends to recirculate and also the temperatures are so high that life molecules would probably be destroyed by the high temperatures and also by the recirculation. If anything ever amounted to something, it would recirculate again. Self-ordering tendencies. So this is based on non-equilibrium thermodynamics as well as ther equilibrium thermodynamics. So when energy is shot through a system at a fairly rapid rate, the system tends to organize itself more than it was in the beginning. However, the comparison that he gives for this is water in a bathtub. Initially, the water is dropping down randomly in drops. However, it, it tends to organize itself into a vortex eventually. The problem with this is that when nature does organize itself, it organizes itself in repetitive, um, repetitive patterns. It doesn't, it doesn't reach the complexity of life. You can't compare the, the order of a vortex. Time's up. Give seven analogies between St. Mary and the church. Please support your answer biblically and or with church father's sayings when applicable and be as detailed as possible. Church A, what does the principal hymn recited daily at the Marian month of Kiah before the feast of Christmas consists of? Please give one church father's saying to support your answer. Part B, give three examples of how the whole dimension of St. Mary's life can be seen as a beautiful icon of the universal church. Please support your answer biblically and or with church father's sayings when applicable and be as detailed as possible. What does the principal hymn recited daily at the Marian month of Kiak before the feast of Christmas consist of? Um, well, it refers to St. Mary as four things. First, it refers to her as the queen to denote um, Jesus as the king who um, shed his blood for our salvation. It also refers to her as the bride to denote, um, to, deny, to denote that Jesus is the bridegroom that united himself with the church. It calls her the high tower because through her son's, um, through her son's blood she is able to enter heaven and um, it also discusses the incarnation that occurred in her womb. Uh, three examples of how the whole dimension of St. Mary's life can be seen as a beautiful icon of the universal church. Um, well, in her womb was united the divine being with the human flesh, so that is um, the unity of the church. Um, it's symbolic of the unity of the church with God in her womb. Um, she also went to visit St. Elizabeth, um, and that is symbolic of the church's missionary work to, um, to save people. Um, uh, St. Mary's also called a lot of things. They call her the tabernacle, the golden censer, the golden lampstand. Give seven analogies between St. Mary and the church. Please support your answer biblically and our church father's sayings when applicable. The first analogy is that St. Mary and the church are both mother and virgin. Um, the St. Mary brought forth the incarnate Son of God and generated him through, um, her, through his own humanity. And the church gives birth to her believers and generates them through the baptism that, may, may, that they may participate in Christ's life. St. Augustine says, um, The virgin gave birth to the Redeemer and the church gave birth to you. The church is both a mother and a virgin. It is a mother in the womb of your love and a virgin in, um, in its inviolate faith. 
the church is the mother over many nations and over one body, just as St. Mary is the mother over many, of many and also the mother of one. The second analogy is, between, is that um, St. Mary and the church are both given the same name, the new Eve. St. Mary gave birth, uh, brought forth the son who gave the world life, and the church um, gives birth to its believers who, um, who receive life through its head, Jesus Christ. The fourth analogy is that the church and the virgin are just as St. Mary, the church is the handmaiden of the Lord. Um, and she should be a humble handmaiden and not and deny any um, works by hu deny any human efforts from like man's power so that the Savior um, may seek her and take her to um, the glory of the heavenly kingdom. The mediation of St. Mary is a daily church function as the valiant and victorious members of Christ um, should seek the renewal of the whole world in Jesus Christ. Additionally, St. Mary is an icon of the church. The first example is at the Annunciation. Um, her, song of, her song of joy and her hymn was by St. By Saint Arrhenius was said as a, pro, a prophet's act in practice of the church rites. His Holiness makes the argument that the conscience of man is affected by various influences. Provide three possible influences that affect the conscience of man from outside him. From the book, explain how each of these influences affect man. Support with a verse where possible. Give a total of four examples of the influences. The question for Church A from the same book is, His Holiness makes the argument that the rationale of man is affected by various influences, provides three possible influences which affect man from outside him. From the book, explain and give an example of how each of these influences affect man in, and their consequences. So the conscience is affected uh, by three things, by uh, the congregation, by the desires, lusts, and sentiments, and by knowledge. So with regard to um, the conscience of man from outside him, the congregation, uh, he's affected by the congregation in the Gospel according to St. John 19, uh, verses 15 and 16. It says uh, when they were plotting to uh, crucify Christ, the people start shouting, away with him, crucify him. And also in Luke 23, 24, Christ himself even says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And uh, so it shows how, the how people were affected by the congregation that Christ himself even says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Um, the prime example of how someone is affected by the congregation is St. Mary, Mag Mary Magdalene. Uh, St. Mary Magdalene, in Matthew 28, 9, she saw the Lord, Lord and held him by the feet, and he worshipped, and she worshipped him. Knowledge affects the conscience. And um, 1 Timothy 1, 13, he says, He counted me faithful uh, by putting me into the ministry, although, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I have been counted, but I obtained mercy because I did it, in unbel because I did it unknowingly and in unbelief. And uh, His Holiness comments on how St. Paul, all his mistakes, he did it with unbelief, without knowledge. Um, Psalm 119 says, um, unless, if I had not delighted in your law, I would have perished in my own affliction. So it shows because of how he denied, uh, delighted in his, his law, he, he did not perish in his affliction, he did not rely on his own knowledge. Proverbs 3, 5, lean not on your own understanding. Um, Proverbs 14.12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So clearly you can't just rely on your knowledge. One of the first influences that can affect the rationale or mind of man from outside of him is um, gossip and rumors. Uh, a person may, for example, His Holiness says a person may have um, a certain opinion um, 
uh, about someone and then uh, hears something from the outside um, and uh, this causes him to change his, um, uh, his opinion and outlook regarding that person. Another example is um, the another example of an influence from outside of man is um, uh, the mind that is influenced uh, or the rationale that is influenced by um, other sects and denominations. His Holiness says that if uh, if a, a person hang, uh, if a person only associates with communists, then he will start um, he will start accepting com uh, communist ideas. Another influence on man from outside of him is the acquisition um, of uh, knowledge, such as news or media. So a person uh, may be influenced by um, books that they read, uh, magazines, um, books that they read, magazines uh, that they read, um, TV shows that they watch, things like that. And um, this, uh, this also will uh, affect the rationale. H additionally, um, from outside of, uh, outside of man, the Holy Spirit also uh, influences the rationale of man. And um, as it says in Psalm 119, it enlightens the mind. Um, and so even though a person might think rationally, um, even though a person might already uh, be able to think, when the Holy Spirit, um, when the Holy Spirit enlightens him, he will be able to think in a proper way, um, leading towards a spi uh, spiritual path. Also, similar to this is the fact that, um, similar to this is uh, the mind that's affected by God's commandments.